Hi everyone, welcome to the inaugural episode of The Attic. I'm your host, Jed Ayers, CEO of iGel. Why Attic, you might ask? Well, lots of tech companies have had humble beginnings. Facebook and Dell in a dorm room, or HP, Microsoft, or Amazon in a garage. Well, for iGel, that humble beginning was in an attic in northern Germany in a town called Bremen nearly 20 years ago. And right around the same time, our development team started in southern Germany in a town called Augsburg, also in an attic. And then, as luck would have it, I found myself in a cramped attic in San Francisco, south of Market, when I started the iGel headquarters four years ago. With the attic story, we want to have conversations here with leaders about origins and about what great leadership looks like and the vision that it takes and the entrepreneurial chops that it takes to grow a company. Our first guest on the inaugural episode is Mark Templeton. Mark is someone who I've known for probably the last 15 years, someone that I very much looked up to. He's a hero, he's an icon, a godfather in the end user compute space. He's someone that is responsible for growing a company from 15 million in revenue to over 3 billion publicly traded company that has over 100 million users of virtual desktop technology that it deploys. Like myself, Mark came up through the ranks in marketing. He's a great storyteller. We're hoping to hear some of his stories today. He's also a, a leader who's uniquely characterized by his ability to be in touch with his emotion and his raw empathy for others. And that empathy extended to, obviously, the Citrix employees, to the partners, and to the customers around the world for Citrix. So hello, Mark. Welcome to the Up in the Attic. And uh, we're so thrilled that you're our first guest here on this uh, show. And uh, to quote one of your trademark uh, songs, and I think your favorite band, it's lovely to see you again, my friend. Oh, Jed, uh, that touches my heart. Thanks so much for um, making me the inaugural uh, guest, you know, for the attic. Uh, it's a real privilege. Thank you so much, Mark. I, uh, I can't, it feels like uh, our first episode and it's like we're in the Super Bowl. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I know that I, I put a post up when I, we were building this set, which of course is in my house. Uh, and I got tens of thousands of views of that pit still picture and lots of people that were excited to watch this and you know, hear what you're up to. But I thought in the spirit of the attic and origins, my, uh, my first question to you really is probably uh, to dig into a little bit of, you know, tell us a little bit about your upbringing and your childhood. Where'd you grow up? And you know, give, yeah. give us a little bit of an insight into the younger Mark Templeton. Yeah, basically I grew up on Long Island um, in a place called Huntington. And, um, you know, my mom's a, a, an artist uh, and my dad, uh, was an electrician. And so, you know, very, uh, we, you know, they, they still live in the 1200 square foot home that, you know, I grew up in, um, in Huntington. And, um, you know, I learned uh, some really important lessons from my parents that um, have lasted my whole life. You know, my dad's incredible work ethic, uh, his, uh, sense of fairness and 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 respect for all people uh you know he was doing diversity and inclusion before it was cool and uh, my mom being an artist you know had this amazing creative bent but it came from a place where she was not afraid to express herself and to be different and the sort of the the worst thing you could ever tell my mom is she wanted to do something because um, your friend, you know, Mary or Johnny, you know, uh, w was doing it. Uh, she always marched to a different drum, and that's what she, you know, really taught me, and I think all of all of us in our family. And um, so, you know, those were sort of the foundational principles. Uh, that, um, you know, I, I built, the, you know, my career, my life on. And, you know, I remember she didn't say it in these words, but <clears throat> what she was really 
trying to say always was be yourself. You know, don't, don't be someone you're not. And she, what she meant and the way I interpreted it is that, you know, when you are yourself and you accept your strengths, your competencies, as well as the things that you're not so good at, um, you're actually, you're at your best. It's right. when you're trying to cover up the, you know, the weaknesses that you have and uh, put facades on and all, that's where you're, you know, struggling to be uh, your best. But I was lucky to have parents that gave me those values very early on. Yeah, I think this is just an amazing part of uh, getting to know anyone is finding out about what their what their parents were like and how that imprint was left on them. And I can see that uh, that sort of individuality uh, that your mom left on you. Maybe it's uh, born out in those great shirts you wear. And that, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I've always been a product guy, you know, products and innovation around products, materials, et cetera have always been the things that have excited me. And uh, after working a couple of years after college, I decided, well, maybe I should learn something about business. And I'm, it didn't start in software. It started actually in, in hardwood, um, uh, in the forest products industry, believe it or not. <laughs> I love this story from, from wood to Citrix. Can you help us understand kind of how, how that path uh, came about? Yeah. Uh, the short version is um, I started a, a company um, uh, to make hardwood moldings, you know, like you'd have around, uh, you know, doors and crown moldings and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And um, and we specialized in hardwood moldings. Okay, wow. And um, so, you know, in, in that kind of business, it's kind of like a butcher, you know, the expression says a butcher has to sell the whole pig, including the oink, in order to make a profit. Mm -hmm. Well, in hardwood, you have to sell absolutely every piece of the board or you can't make any money. Mm -hmm. So I told my partner, you know, we needed a piece, we need a piece of software that figures this out. Uh, and he said, well, does any exist? And I said, no, but you know, uh, I'll write it. And he said, do you know how to write software? And I said, no, but how hard could it be? And um, we both laughed and, you know, and that's, and I dove in and I taught myself to write the software that um, we use to run the, the, the factory 24 hours a day. When you think about what it means to be an entrepreneur and uh, someone says, do you know how to do this? And you said, no. I'll go figure it out, right? I mean, this is this is a uh, part of your DNA, I think. This yeah, I think. But the big, the sort of the big point of the story was, you know, I I got exposed to software because of what it could do in terms of the human outcome. In our case, they were, you know, we were a small business. We employed local people, and it allowed us to you know, employ more people and it allowed us to make better products and all. And I saw that connection between software and outcomes for, for a small business in that case. And uh, I went to my partner, his name is Vaughn, uh, is, uh, Vaughn. we're not partners anymore, but his name is Vaughn Nickel. And I said, hey, Vaughn, I, I just got to tell you something. You know, I, uh, I, I love you. I love the hardwood molding business, but I love software a whole lot more than I than than hardwood. Right. And and so I told him that I really needed to go off and pursue um, uh, software. Sounds like you got a great uh, sort of frame of reference from the wood to the reseller. I can imagine that gave you empathy for the partner. Uh, component, which I felt personally when I worked with you as a reseller uh, to uh, building products. So how do you find yourself at Citrix? I mean, this is a Cinderella story for anyone, right? To, uh, to be at a company with a, uh, you know, a few dozen people, 50 million in revenue to where you landed it 
over $3 billion. Can you uh, Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Believe it or not, the guy that uh, uh, started Land Systems was on the board of directors at Citrix from early on. Mm -hmm. And um, so he, in 1993, introduced me to uh, Roger Roberts, who was uh, Citrix CEO. And uh, Roger and I hit it off instantaneously. Uh, I met the rest of the team and they didn't really, uh, they wanted someone with a big established resume, which I did not have uh, for their chief marketing officer. And um, which was fine, you know, you want to join a team that, you know, wants you on the team. You don't want to push yourself onto a team. And so um, that was in 1993. And um, so in um, January of 1995, uh, Roger uh, called me and um, we were living in Los Gatos, California. And uh, he asked if I was interested in coming back and interviewing again. And I said, no. And uh, he said, why not? And I said, well, because in the meantime, I moved my family to California, Silicon Valley, where I could be a software migrant worker without having to uproot my family every time. Yeah, well, I know Los Gatos is a hard place to move out of, I'm sure. Yeah, a few weeks later, he called me again. And then he called me again. And, he, and I kept saying, no, 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 until finally, um, probably, I think, uh, let's see, it would have been in uh, May uh, of uh, 1995, he, he called and he said, um, you know, you really, you really ought to come and talk to us. Um, you'd, be, you'd be perfect fit with the team. And, um, so he had softened me up by that time. And uh, uh, I said, okay, you know, I can't promise you anything. And he said, well, I want you to bring your wife and, I, and, um, and there's one condition. And I said, well, what's that condition? And he said that when you're here, you have to make a decision. And I said to myself, uh, well, that's easy. You know, I can always say no. Right. So, you know, that's not much of a condition. And um, so uh, we went, uh, it was over a long Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, 1995. And uh, on Sunday, Roger uh, sat me down Sunday morning with a yellow legal pad and said, okay, here's about what we can pay you. And a salary and there are no bonuses, but you know, there are options and we'll move you and so forth. So we kind of went back and forth. I asked some questions. Then he, uh, he uh, at the bottom of the pad, he drew an X and a line and then another X and a line and then a third X and a line. And uh, I said, what's that third X for? And he said, that's for your wife, Yvonne. Sure, well, yeah. Call her uh, from the hotel because she has to sign up too. Wow. So a great lesson there, you know, in recruiting and commitment. Uh, you know, Roger is the mo one of the most important mentors in my life. And um, so I joined Citrix. Uh, you know, I went back to California, gave notice and um, started on June um, 12th of 1995. And um, there were, I was the 52nd employee uh, in terms of employee numbers. And um, I, uh, I remember uh, a couple of things vividly. Uh, the first all hands meeting, which was maybe a week after I got there, uh, Roger asked me to stand up and say a few words, introduce myself. And uh, I did, and I, uh, I uh, introduced myself and I thanked everyone for doing the hardest work of a startup. And that's to find, to invent a product and technology and to find the product market fit 
um, because they had done the, the, the treacherous work uh, 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 of a startup. And I was the luckiest guy alive in terms of timing, um, in terms of when I came in as the head of marketing. One of the things I remember you sharing with me was, we want to be your very best partner. And I worked at the time for a very large reseller that was uh, doing hundreds of millions of dollars and working with Cisco and Microsoft and NetApp. And uh, that always stood out for me, right? I, I was on the, the advisory councils for these companies and no one ever said this to me, right? That we want to be your number one uh, partner. And that was more than just profitability. It was about like integrity around, you know, how deals would come together. And I have to say, this is something that attracted me to come to iGel in the fact that iGel was able to say, we've never sold a single thing direct. And uh, for me, as someone who spent 20 years in the channel, you know, wrangling with all these convoluted routes to market, uh, to be able to look people in the eye and say, we will never compete against you. Uh, this has been a, uh, something that I, I certainly looked up to what you were able to accomplish. And you know, we're starting to see some of the impact of the leverage uh, that you get from building true partnerships. Yeah, when you're honest and honorable and serious about it, you know, it's magical. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, as a startup, you have to start by selling direct, if for no other reason than to understand the customer and understand what, you know, uh, what you're going to eventually teach partners to do right, right, right. And how you build the program you know because you, you you know partners will generally they will not create a market for you um, they'll respond to a market that you create so you have to be in there with your hands on in the beginning and i think a lot of companies you know get uh, uh sort of uh mesmerized by you know that direct hands-on and they don't, you know, trust partners to take over, you know, uh, for them. And I can tell you, I, 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 will, I won't use any names, but when I got to Citrix, uh, I had a channel manager who is a director level guy. Uh, he was a channel manager. And in, the, in my second staff meeting, so that's two weeks in, uh, it, was, he, it was clear he didn't respect partners. And in my third week, I let him go. And I went to Roger and I said, Roger, I can't build an honest, honorable channel, you know, uh, uh, network and partnership and relationships, you know, with someone who doesn't respect them. Right. And um, sure yeah. that sent a signal to the whole company at that point. For me, I, I look at you and it's sort of, we have similar paths in the sense that I'm a CMO that became a global CEO this, this year. Any uh, particular advice for, uh, for me as someone that, uh, you know, I would love to be able to follow in your footsteps and see iGel grow to 3 billion? Yeah, uh, well, uh, yes, I do. I have advice for, for you. It's, Jed, it's not specific to you. Um, it's just spe specific to, to all, you know, younger executives that find themselves in an OJT role, you know, because I, when I became president and CEO of Citrix, I, you know, we were a public company and I had none of that experience. So I always considered myself an on the job trained and in training CEO. Mm -hmm. And it took me um, some years to realize that um, for the company to grow, I had to grow. Um, and so every year in January, I would sit down and reflect and, and write down, you know, what things I needed to either learn or do differently, uh, or uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever initiatives that were all completely within my control in order to enable um, uh, my own development 
and therefore growth and therefore to not be a bottleneck uh, on the growth of the company. And, um, you know, I would do things like I would read books that would teach me something. I would go to conferences that would teach me something. I would. And so you would actually write this down though, these, these things you'd write them. I would write them down and I would share them with my staff, you know, and if they had thoughts, I would listen to them. Um, because, you know, when people give you honest, um, and constructive cri criticism or, you know, uh, feedback, uh, it's a gift. It's, it's, it, you know, it's priceless, but it's only priceless if you listen to it, uh, and, and, and do something with it. Right. And so my advice is to always be a student and always realize that the, the company and people behind you can't, can only grow in size, scale, and velocity, et cetera, um, if you do, all right, which puts the accountability on you, all right? right. Part of that is um, a principle I call standing on the shoulders of others. Uh, there's so many entrepreneurs that uh, just run out of, of uh, well, they run out of altitude because they're uncomfortable um, or they're just unaware that they're not hiring people that are bigger than themselves. Agreed. So, you know, if you, uh, everyone, you know, has a competency, you know, it could be marketing, it could be sales, it could be finance, it could be engineering, you know, you need to hire people that are outside your competency, okay, for sure you know, that are much more confident than you are uh, and have seen greater scale than you've seen. So uh, that's how you stand on the shoulders of others. And I'd say the hardest um, person to hire it, um, in that sense is the person uh, that reflects your own competency. Right, the marketing person in your case or mine. That's, that's exactly right. That's the hardest hire to get. And my advice there is do not hire someone like you. Because, you know, in every role, every leadership role, you know, uh, I, I, it's like ice cream. You know, CMOs come in different flavors. Right. And so don't hire the flavor that you are. Hire the flavor that you're not. And then, you know, you'll have someone who's complimentary and who's adding to the team. Um, and you'll have a lot more fun working with that person, you know, uh, in addition. Yeah. So it's almost like it came full circle because you, you shared in the beginning, your mom told you not to be afraid of the things that you uh, weren't great at. Right. And so, yeah, I, hear, I see this coming through. I think that's probably an interesting segue as we roll into talking about the here and now, right? As 2020 kind of almost puts a new uh, imprint on this. As somebody who was sort of the godfather of the Anyplace workspace and you know, your, your famous video, I think in 2001, that talked about you know, the future of work, you know, is, how do you see this sort of pandemic sort of fulfilling some of the things you worked on your entire life? Yeah, I, you know, we, I'd say, the virtual workplace um, and all the tech, the ideas and all the technologies um, there that we were part of creating, you know, we had to, we had to push um, people to do it because it was a change in core behavior for, yeah, especially older people, older generation people. And the significance there is older generations are role models. They tend to be the managers and leaders and decision makers. And so they, they are the obstacles to change when it comes to behavior. And um, so today, when you look at it, um, and uh, you know, the, the, the pandemic has been a great accelerant of many, many, many things 
but you know, it's been a great accelerant to the way people work. And, um, and that's come in conjunction with all of the cloud and SaaS kind of infrastructure and technologies and more and more of a younger generation in, the, in decision-making roles. Mm-hmm. So once people, um, you know, are, have experienced the kind of productivity, the kind of work-life balance uh, that uh, they're experiencing today due to the pandemic, uh, not of course not in every industry, but in you know uh, the you know uh, many industries uh, that are um, let's say paced by computing. Um, you know, uh, there's a, a lot's been learned, and um, I think we're never going back right, right. because uh, those I, the the behavioral ideas that we're holding holding us back have been, you know, kind of destroyed. And um, um, so, you know, better, more productivity, I think more engaged employees that have a better balance of work and life um, than let's say, you know, I did when, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, in my mid career, obviously the pendulum will swing back some um, uh, because not every role lends itself to, uh, you know, work from anywhere. But I think um, all roles probably lend themselves to uh, that in part, at least. Uh, After taking the helm of a a company that has 450 people in it, I would love to see some of them. And you miss that human interaction that we're all wired for, right? yeah, maybe yeah. not a uh, you know quarter million miles on a plane a year, but certainly hungry for uh, you know interacting with partners and customers and employees. And yeah, I think uh, you know this is this is a, a new balance that we will find. Um, I certainly look at sort of this idea that VDI and you know DAS maybe was ten percent, fifteen percent of the use case inside of an organization. We see that accelerating through this dramatically. I mean. I've been on a lot of phone calls with you know uh, CIOs in the last few weeks, and you know as they sort of harden towards like a billion people, you know that uh, have had to work from home, the cloud and the edge loom very large in that uh, capacity to actually realize this. So, love to get your thoughts. I see that you've joined WorkSpot uh, as a, a on their board, so I, I imagine you have something to say about uh, this sort of cloud delivered. Ed, anywhere, anywhere to the edge uh, architecture. In the Citrix, my Citrix era, it was about sort of inventing the market and creating our own wind <laughs> um, to, to define the market. You know, in this, uh, at this point in time, you know, the tailwinds are, are being created by demand, natural demand for work from anywhere in combination with uh, heightened um, uh, uh, sets of issues around information security, you know, data loss protection, those kinds of things, as well as um, reach around uh, talent um, and reaching talent, you know, where it is, as opposed to, uh, you know, uh, talent that's in specific geographic areas. So I think it's never been a better time for, you know, this kind of uh, remote desktop, you know, technology. Um, And at the same time, now we have um, new technologies, you know, like you find at WorkSpot, even at uh, with Amazon Workspaces, where the they were written from the very first line of code to be cloud native and um, you know and with a cloud native approach you get you know a service level you get telemetry you get security you get performance that there's just no other way to get it you know yeah. the uh, elasticity and the scale is is so quick i mean we 
We saw this uh, at Microsoft, and I'd love for you to comment a little bit about Windows Virtual Desktop, right? Because this is obviously, uh, you know, with Microsoft entering into this and a new protocol with RD Core yeah. and, and some of uh, the licensing, as you know, always looms large in terms of how yeah. Microsoft uh, b builds out a market. So love your yeah. thoughts on how, how Microsoft uh, yeah, plays into this. Yeah, well, I think they, as usual, play play big because, you know, the enterprise desktop is a, is a Windows uh, desktop, <laughs> and uh, and and Microsoft controls the licensing. I think that, uh, you know, Microsoft is uh, certainly enlightened, to, in the sense of, um, you you see what they're doing in the, the non-Windows world, I mean, this is really uh, Satya's legacy. It's that he broke down the, uh, the mindset that everything has to, if it's not Windows, it's not important right. at Microsoft. So, so I think th it's in their interest to see, you know, the, um, the, the, the ubiquity of uh, Windows as the enterprise desktop. And so, you know they're they're obviously doing two things. They're they're uh, sponsoring partners, whether whether it's the you know the Citrix VMware style approach, which is more the do-it-yourself, pick the hardware software combos that you want, et cetera, and integrate them, uh, or you pick the SaaS style um, offering like a WorkSpot. Uh, or even Amazon Workspaces, um, it's in their interest to uh, uh, to to push um, that market forward because it does solve uh, problems and use cases that um, a a physical machine just is either too expensive or just can't do it. We're living color of that too, right? We were on the stage. Uh with them launching this last November, which was strange, right? For a uh, Linux operating system, you know, to be uh, standing on this stage uh, with Microsoft. But as you stated, this is the legacy of Satya sort of driving this um, Azure consumption and uh, not so tied to live and die on Windows um, as, yeah. as long as it's being delivered out of, out of Azure. I'd love for you to talk for a minute. Like I know you're a technologist at heart, and you have a lot of uh, great insights and opinions and vision. But you know, when you think about Linux, it's sort of ubiquitous. It's one everywhere, right? It's in the supercomputers. It's running the cloud workloads. It's on four out of five phones. It's it's in IoT. It's in your Tesla. Um, the one place it hasn't really you know won is is at the edge uh, for you know knowledge workers and the desktop. But we at iGel have this sort of thesis that says. You know, if everything's going to be delivered out of uh, out of the cloud, you know, you don't need this huge piece of hardware with this huge complex operating system that's hard to secure and manage. You actually need a hyper-tuned, sort of light, ultra-secure, uh, you know, in Linux der derived uh, operating system, which just happens to be what iGel has created. Right, this idea that you can put that on any any device and consume across any one of those cloud uh, protocol delivery mechanisms. I think what, what, what you all have done in terms of the software and then its manifestation in different form factors, you know, is really impressive and, um, you know, allows you to satisfy lots and lots of use cases from, you know, re, retreading, um, you know, older equipment, you know, uh, an older laptop uh, or booting, you know, real time to your client uh, to the other end of the spectrum, you know, to be able to, you know, handle multiple screens and, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, offer workstation like experience to uh, engineers and so forth. But to the degree that we're talking about uh, business devices, then, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, the, the simpler it is, the fewer moving parts there are, you know, the easier it is to manage lockdown, secure, and so forth, 
and the better the cloud is in, in terms of services, uh, the more value an endpoint like that has. So when I think of uh, DAS, desktop as a service, I, can, I think of it as the, the great end user computing utility where, you know, you uh, eventually will be able to, you know, pay for consumption uh, and uh, you'll be able to plug pretty much any kind of device, including, you know, eye gel, different ty types of eye gel toasters, right. you know, you can plug them in and they just work. Yep, I think that's the key to this whole thing is the simplicity and just the high performance. Uh, and like you said, it's like it becomes a utility appliance almost. And, and I can tell you from uh, being nine months in this house with, uh, with kids that are Zoom, Zoom schooling, that uh, the internet is more important and the cloud is more important than the running water in this house. When it goes yeah. down, I, uh, I get a lot of grief, so. Like I said at the beginning, we're honored to uh, to bring you uh, back into the uh, public eye through the attic. And uh, you know, there's some fun things that were asked on the uh, on the LinkedIn I posted. One of the questions that came in, Mark, was I know you're like a, a gadget guy, and uh, you always had the latest gadgets. You even built jackets that would store them and uh, bring them out on the stage at Synergy. So is there any yeah. gadget you have on your uh, desk? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, now that you mention it, here, I'll show you a couple. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, oh, this, yeah, uh, this I'll do it. I'll, I'll do like I usually do, Jay. I'll do a live demo. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, and I'm not going to start these up. So, you know, here's the duo, oh, the, wow. the Surface wow. duo. That, and cool. um, so that, you know, and, and I do like to have my hands on these things to try to understand their potential, right, even, right. If, even if this is, you know, a, a learning experiment for Microsoft, it's pretty interesting. Um, and I don't know, it's, you know, this, it's, a, it's a version 1.0 and um, I've had fun using it, you know, as sort of a secondary phone and device and so is uh, that one of those devices you used to call a snacking device yeah this is this is kind of in between you okay. know snacking and and uh and dining but um you know so this is a cool one and then <clears throat> this is uh this is another interesting one this is called a light phone okay, okay. so um there's a there's, I have another version of it in here somewhere, but basically um, think of it as a limited feature smartphone. And so what its market is, is for people who want to, um, like you go out to dinner and you don't want to be disturbed with all this stuff that's on your smartphone. Right, right. You know, you take this and it, and it does just basic things. That's great. So that doesn't have the distraction of going down the rabbit hole of pulling out your photos or right. whatever. Right. In the middle of it doesn't there. have any of that. Yeah. So yeah. it's an interesting experiment again in who makes that and so forth. So it's a cool device. And who makes that? Um, it's made by light phone. Light L phone. Yeah. L I G H T phone. That's great. The, another one that came in was well, if you're going to get the Tesla truck. <laughs> I know you have, how, how many Teslas do you have? You have pretty much all of them, right? Yeah, I do. Well, uh, the Roadster, which was, you know, number 16, um, it just sat and sat in the garage eventually. And I found uh, uh, an engineer at NASA in, uh, at Ames Research uh, who wanted it badly and uh so it got a great home okay. with a young with this young uh engineer and his wife uh down in southern california um but uh, i have a model three and i and i have a, a model x uh both uh i have uh, uh one in california and i have one here so you know i have the third uh you know the serial number three model x and Amazing. um it's a, yeah, it's a great, it's just a great car, but uh, I, I hate to disappoint, you know, Tesla, because I love Tesla, 
but um, uh, a number of the earlier Tesla people that uh, really, uh, they, they were re responsible for the Model S, uh, they left the company and they started a, a company uh, called Ativa that is now called Lucid Motors. And um, they uh, just launched the car uh, and it's, they've, they, they took everything they learned designing the Model S and improved on it uh, to build something called the Lucid Air. So my next electric car is going to be uh, the Lucid Air Dream Edition. And uh, I should have well, it next Mark, year. Mark, we can count on you to be the uh, early adopter. So I have the Model S P100D, which is uh, you know, just an amazing car. So I'll have to check back with you on how the uh, Lucifer Air compares. This yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's got a thousand horsepower. Oh, wow. Range of uh, over about 400 or so miles. Um, and um, it's uh, the fit and finish would be much more like a, a luxury. Um, yeah, like a luxury car, you right. know. And I like the simplicity of the Tesla. So, you know, I'm not complaining about the Tesla, but it's one of the things that makes the Lucid uh, uh, different. And they did a lot of uh, improvements in packaging of the, of the batteries, in the packaging of the motors, miniaturizing all of that. So they, so they get much more space to give to occupants and luggage and so forth. Hmm. And um, yeah, it's quite, a, quite, quite an impressive uh, piece of work. Yeah, well, uh, I guess we, I'm getting the sign from Ron that we should uh, wind yeah. this down, but I, I, I'm so grateful for you being on this, Mark, and uh, being our inaugural guest on The Attic. And uh, I love what you said about be a lifelong learner and uh, obviously your humility and kindness and the sort of empathy that you have for, for everyone that you come into contact with has, uh, has left a, a, a legacy. And I know there's thousands of people out there that will hopefully watch this. Any parting words you want to share with, uh, with them? Yes. And, uh, you know, it's really simple. The words are thank you. You know, that, uh, you know, I could never have had the life experience that I've had uh, without the thousands of hands and hearts um, of the Citrix community. And that's worldwide. Um, you know, red carpets were always rolled out for me. People always, you know, were there to lend a hand, to do something special, uh, and to share the belief system that we held so dear at Citrix. And you know, I can only say thank you to, you know, to, to the entire Citrix community for that experience. You know, you made my life. Well, classic Mark Templeton, thank you so much for being with us. And uh, we look forward to hopefully having a chat with you sometime in the near future. Let's not let another five years go by. I, I'd love to do that, Jed. And, uh, you know, wishing you a lot of success at IGEL and, um, uh, of course, if there's ever anything I can do to, to be helpful to you and your team, uh, just say the word. Thank you so much. Well, thanks everybody for joining our first episode of The Attic. I hope you enjoyed uh, listening to Mark. He's certainly a wealth of information and insights and uh, just a very uh, special guy. So uh, this is, uh, like I said, the first episode of this video podcast and we're gonna have many more. You can stay tuned to hear from guests uh, we have lined up. Tim Minahan, the CMO of Citrix, is going to come on. We have Brian Madden, the legendary blogger and now evangelist at VMware. We have the CEO of Teradici, David Smith, and a host of other people that uh, are from a wide variety of uh, perspectives in the end-user compute space as well as uh, outside of our space uh, with uh, venture capital and private equity and um, lots of interesting perspectives coming soon on this video podcast so please subscribe to the igel youtube channel and you'll get all the alerts as to when the next updates happen and until then i wish you a great day be kind to each other and uh, be well